So thanks so much to, to all of you. Thank you to, to Euroclosure, to, to Cognitech, to all of our sponsors, to the venue, to the city of Bratislava, um, everyone who helped make this possible. Uh, and this talk is dedicated to uh, my younger brother who passed away uh, unexpectedly this summer. Cool, so, uh, hello. Um, this is a computer talk, so I feel like you have to start with zero. Um, my name is Eric, I actually like the elevators here in, in Europe um, because they have that zero floor, um, which I find reassuring. Um, so I tend to speak extremely quickly, um, especially when I'm excited and talking about closure and machine learning is very exciting. Um, so I'm gonna to try to slow it down a bit, especially uh, since it now occurs to me that many of you do not speak English as your first language, um, and so I'll, I'll, try to be, I'll try to be good. Um, but if you're having trouble following along or I'm kind of going off the rails a bit, uh, feel free to make some kind of giant hand gesture, kind of like a this or like a, I don't know, something to kind of slow me down a bit. That would be super helpful. Um, so I'm just gonna talk for about 35 or 40 minutes, um, somewhere in that window. Um, so like I said, my name is Eric, uh, Eric Weinstein. I work at Hulu as a senior software engineering lead. Um, you can find me on GitHub, Twitter, the internet, etc. in this human map that I made. Um, I write a fair amount of Ruby, JavaScript, Python, and some Go at work. I write a fair amount of Clojure and Elixir for side projects. I'm, I'm trying to shoehorn Clojure into a large Java project at Hulu and hopefully it goes well. Um, I'm also a newly minted Idris contributor, so if anyone wants to talk about any of those languages, uh, please, please let me know. Uh, I've been writing Clojure for about three years, so I'm still extremely new at this. This is actually my first Clojure conference, um, so this is really exciting. Um, I also uh, recently wrote a book called Ruby Wizardry uh, that teaches Ruby to eight to 12 year old kids. And Ruby's kind of like closure, right? I feel like they're both lisps. Um, or we can, we can fight about that at the unsessions or at the bar later. Um, but uh, anyway, insofar as Ruby is like closure, uh, or if you're interested in Ruby, uh, and there's you know, someone in your life who's you know, in that eight to 12 range, you might enjoy the book, please uh, come find me after the show. And uh, there's a, a Euro Ruby 30 discount, so if you go to the No Starch website, uh, it'll be 30% off. So, uh, Thanks also to No Starch. This is not a long talk, but I think we still sort of benefit from knowing where we're going to go. So we'll talk briefly about machine learning in general, uh, supervised learning in particular, decision trees and neural networks in very particular, I guess. Um, we'll be using Apache Spark uh, for the decision tree, and we'll be talking about two uh, DSLs for, for Spark, uh, Flambo and Sparkling. And then we'll transition to talk about uh, neural networks, deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks, deep learning, uh, and we'll talk about the uh, DL4J library. Is this speed okay so far? Good? Awesome, thank you. Okay, so part one, spark. That's supposed to be a spark. I couldn't find a spark emoji, so I mixed lightning and sparkle together, which I feel like is kind of like a spark. Um, so uh, like I said, we'll be doing machine learning, and in, in particular, we'll be looking at supervised learning. Uh, and using uh, Apache Spark to do it. So what is machine learning? How many of you feel like you have a, a good grasp of machine learning? Uh, that's a lot more than I expected, all right. So uh, feel free to correct me uh, later on. Uh, so anyway, what is, what is machine learning? Uh, if I were to pick a word, I, uh, I suppose I would pick generalization, right? Uh, the idea is to help a program assemble rules for dealing with data so the machine can act without being explicitly programmed. And um, you know, what do I mean by that? You know, essentially, you want to do some kind of pattern recognition. If you want to ask a machine, hey, is this a car or not? Um, how much should this house cost? Uh, things of that nature. Um, or if there are underlying patterns in your data that you want to tease out, uh, kind of you know, grouping or clustering elements accordingly, uh, machine learning is sort of what you'll be doing. And in particular, supervised learning is uh, sort of the first one I talked about, was this idea that you go from labeled data um, things that you know what they are in the world, um, and then sort of making predictions about unlabeled data based on that information. Uh, generally speaking, it's either classification or regression. The, using the prior example, classification might be, you know, if we were gonna do it with people, go outside and say, hey, that's a car, that's a car, that's not a car, that's not a car. And then maybe we go to another part of Bratislava or Norway or the moon, and I say, okay, brand new P1 
pieces of information, is this a car or not? Um, and then in terms of, uh, so that's classification in terms of regression. Um, we might say, hey, given all these data points, uh, how much, you know, for the price of a house, let's say, you know, the x-axis is square footage or some other feature of houses, uh, and the y-axis is price, uh, how might we predict the, the price of a house that we've not seen before, that we don't already know the price of? So Apache Spark is, I'm gonna be terrible and read this to you, is an open source cluster computing framework. Um, the parallelism that Spark affords us is sort of ideal for processing large data sets. Um, in several talks so far, we've talked about the virtues of parallelization and, you know, when things are embarrassingly parallel, I think was the quote, uh, we, should, we should work in parallel. Uh, and in machine learning, you know, the more data, the better. So uh, at a certain point, uh, running computations in parallel uh, becomes not just nice, but crucial. Spark is interesting for a few reasons. Um, it keeps a fair amount in working memory, which we'll talk about more in a second. Um, the idea is to sort of limit I.O., right? Um, if you sort of think about Hadoop, Hadoop is great for this kind of work, but uh, as far as I know, it writes to disk after each MapReduce step. Uh, and so I guess the HDD I.O. sort of becomes a bottleneck. So not having that as an issue is nice. Um, and Spark will work with a variety of data stores, SQL via JDBC, for example, or you can write Cassandra queries, or use an HDFS file, or a plain flat text file. Uh, it's sort of up to you. And there's a little bit of terminology that comes with Spark if you've not used it. Um, the, the main sort of abstraction is the RDD, the Resilient Distributed Data Set, uh, which is a collection of data that could be on any node in the cluster, hence distributed, and resilient because if data are lost, it's not a problem, Spark can recompute the missing data. And there are two JVM objects that are interesting to know about generally and are valuable when working with Spark uh, data sets, which are sort of RDD and Spark SQL execution engine combined, and data frames, which are sort of organized data sets um, that are kind of mapped to named columns. Data sets and data frames, like I said, are, are JVM objects. We'll see them a little bit uh, in the code to follow, although they're, they sort of run under the hood in Clojure because, you know, we don't generally have type information. It, it sort of doesn't matter uh, what the type is, uh, I suppose, until uh, the JVM yelled at you, which happens relatively frequently, at least in my experience. Um, okay. So our data. The data that I've been using um, is police stop data for the city of Los Angeles. I'm, I'm from LA. Uh, in the year 2015. There are four features that we currently care about. There are more in the original data set, uh, which is what that bit.ly link is to. So if you're curious, you can follow that link and you can take a look at the LA open data. There's a lot of actually very interesting uh, open data about the, the city of LA. Um, and there are roughly 600,000 instances, which sounds like a big number until you realize we're talking about Spark and machine learning and, and large data, big data pipelines. Um, and 600,000 instances is not very much. Uh, you know, this, this can be done with scikit-learn. I have done it with scikit-learn. Um, you don't need to do, uh, you know, sort of big data machine learning for this relatively small amount of data, but um, I think it's valuable to know how it works so that if you do have millions of rows, you have a, a nice solution that you can leverage. So I mentioned we had a few features that we care about. So the ones that I kind of took advantage of while I was doing this machine learning work uh, were the, so the, the police data are effectively people who were stopped by police officers in the city of LA. And the information we have are their sex, whether they are male or female, uh, their race, which the open data keeps track of six, uh, American, Indian, Asian, black, Hispanic, white, or other, and the stop type, whether it was a pedestrian, you know, someone was jaywalking, something like that, or uh, if they were pulled over in a car. And the label, uh, the thing that we sort of care about is this, post-stop activity which is not really well defined in the literature. It's kind of hard to pin down, but it, it means uh, arrest or search, generally speaking. So given that this person was stopped, was there any kind of activity? Were they searched? Were they arrested, brought down to the station, things like that? Um, and gen most of the data actually here are, are binary. You know, it's male or female, pedestrian or vehicle. Yes, there was post-stop activity. No, there was not. Uh, the only one that has a sort of a, a more values is the, uh, is the race, which, uh, as I mentioned, has six potential values. So given that we have this data in this shape, you know, this many features, this many instances, um, how are we going to go about doing this machine learning magic? And I decided that a decision tree would be a, a good place to start. 
Um, I picked decision trees because they're fast, relatively speaking, uh, as opposed to something like a support vector machine, which can, can be very computationally expensive. Um, they're robust to noise, um, meaning that if there's missing or mislabeled data, the tree will, generally speaking, uh, still work. It will still have predictive power. Although these data are fairly clean, I don't think there's any missing data, and uh, I don't recall finding any mislabeled data, though I did not look all the way <laughs> through the data set. And uh, decision trees are also good for sort of binary and or uh, disjunctive input, you know, you know, are they male or female? Are they, you know, is it a vehicle or is it a, a pedestrian? Uh, there's a common saying in machine learning that there's no free lunch. Uh, generally speaking, there is no magic method or magic set of hyperparameters you can use and say, this will work well over the data, or in fact, what, better than sort of random chance over all possible data sets. And certainly decision trees have their downsides. They are prone to overfitting, which I guess you could think of as believing your data too much. Uh, as the tree grows and grows and grows, it will start to model and work off of every single nuance in the data. And so if there is a fair amount of noise, if there are mislabeled attributes, if there's something, you know, maybe some unmodeled feature that is sort of warping things in a weird way that you don't know about, uh, it will model that too. And you'll lose predictive power. You'll start to be super, super good at predicting how your particular data set will work. But when you try to generalize to data points you haven't seen before, um, you'll still be modeling noise and not necessarily modeling the true underlying values that you care about. So we can address this in a couple ways. Um, we happen to have low dimensionality just by my pruning out features that I didn't think were valuable. Um, another form of pruning, which is literally pruning the tree, limiting the size of the tree, saying, you know, there is only a certain number of levels you can have in the tree, there's only a certain number of leaf nodes that we're going to allow. And we also have the option of certain ensemble machine learning methods, uh, such as boosting. Uh, the way boosting works is you might have like a bunch of little tiny baby decision trees, each of which is maybe good at classifying some subset of the data, and by definition these little weak learners have to just be slightly better than chance. Um, so if there's two potential values, as long as they're right more than half the time, uh, they qualify as weak learners. And as long as you have these little weak learners, um, the boosting algorithm, and the math is actually super, super interesting, I encourage you to take a look after the show. Um, but when you have all these little weak learners operating together, uh, and they begin to focus on the problems that they haven't gotten right so far, uh, you really can see very uh, noticeable and very interesting uh, improvements in your predictive power. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about boosting later. Um, and as long as these little decision trees themselves are not overfitting, um, and as long as there's not uniform or, or pink noise in your data that would cause the boosting algorithm to sort of try really, 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 really hard to get those questions that can't get right, right, and it turns out it's working off of noise, um, boosting is a valuable sort of additional heuristic. Um, decision trees, uh, as you might know, are, you know, trees. Uh, they're biased towards shorter trees, so fewer levels, um, and uh, towards high information gain, which you can think of as kind of good splits at the top. Um, it's hard to read, uh, but the very top, the root of the tree is actually splitting on uh, the person's uh, sex, whether they're male or female. Um, this is actually um, a decision tree for this data set, uh, though this was from an earlier iteration um, from some work I was doing with Python and, and scikit-learn, so this was not uh, uh, generated by the Spark code we're about to see. Uh, so I couldn't find a sparkling logo, but this is just sparkles, there's no lightning, so I figured that would be okay. Um, and so the two DSLs we're going to look at are uh, Flambeau uh, on the, on your left, my right, and uh, sparkling on uh, the other side. And uh, this is shameless plug time. Flambeau is named after a character from a cartoon called Adventure Time, and Adventure Time is available on Hulu. Though, uh, it now occurs to me that Hulu is only available in the United States. So, uh, sorry guys. Um, anyway, so let's look at some code. I've been talking for long enough. Um, so Flambeau is uh, the, the code you see up here on the screen. The way that this works is we sort of need a Spark context to operate off of, so we do a little bit of configuration, and uh, we can use that Spark context later on as we're working through our machine learning example. Um, so this is relatively straightforward. Um, conf comes from Flambeau. Conf um, F is the Flambeau API, so these are just two namespaces available from the Flambeau library. Um, so we have a Spark configuration. Uh, we're setting our master to be local. We're setting our app name as Euroclosure because we're here at Euroclosure. Um, and we uh, pass that into uh, F Spark context to generate our Spark context. As you can see, the sparkling example is devastatingly different. Uh, in fact, I think the only difference is the actual namespace. So if you wanted to import Spark as F, you could have the exact same code. Um, so you'll notice these are extremely similar. 
and that's because Flambeau and Sparkling are themselves extremely similar. Um, there are a few differences. Uh, for example, there are tiny things, for example, order of arguments uh, for their map functions, they each define their own mapping function for mapping over RDDs. Um, if I recall correctly, Flambeau does uh, function and then collection and uh, Sparkling is the other way around. Um, and then there's some more interesting differences. Uh, the destructuring tools available in Sparkling are a little bit different, I think a little bit more nuanced than what's available in, in Flambeau. Um, and they're in a separate namespace that if you're um, not careful and you don't AOT compile, uh, you'll get a lot of weird errors. So if that happens to you, that is why. And uh, so both of these are, are valuable in terms of kind of setting up our example, getting configurations in Spark context, things like that working. Um, unfortunately, I feel like there's a, a limitation in both of these where they don't quite make the leap to wrapping model creation, predictions, things like that. So there's a little bit of interop uh, that we have to do, which isn't bad. Uh, but something to be aware of for, for both of these libraries. So we've defined a model which uses the uh, Apache Spark uh, decision tree train classifier method. Uh, we have a training set that I have kind of pre-split and set up off screen. Um, two just is a description, I believe, of the, uh, the label, uh, I guess, arity, if you will, that it's either yes or no in terms of post-op activity. Um, categorical features info is, again, sort of off screen, but it's uh, basically it's a map that explains to Spark, hey, uh, you're going to get in this column, the first one that describes sex, you're gonna have one of two possible values. Uh, for race, there are six possible values. For stop type, there are two possible values. So just kind of giving hints to Spark. Um, Genie, or Genie, I've never pronounced it out loud, um, is just one of a couple different methods for uh, handling information gain. And here we've set a max depth of five on the tree and uh, limited the leaves to 32. So uh, limiting the size of the tree is, is sort of a form of pruning, which I mentioned is necessary to avoid overfitting. I haven't really gotten a chance to tune these much, and it's very possible that playing around with them a bit more would yield better results. So if you haven't done a bunch of <laughs> machine learning before, um, it's like 99% getting good data, uh, either finding it or cleaning it, um, generally cleaning it, um, and then tuning hyperparameters to sort of figure out what works well. You sort of intelligently tune them, you don't just kind of spin knobs, but uh, you spend a fair amount of time seeing if uh, certain changes that you have a hunch might be correct are in fact correct. And as mentioned, there's a, a little bit of interop. Um, it's worth noting that in the prediction method, the uh, thing that's being predicted is actually a labeled point, not a string, uh, or, or some more primitive method. Uh, we effectively have kind of a, a little object that comes to us from Java and says, hey, uh, here's the data and here's the label that's associated, and the prediction is effectively coming back with the actual label and then the predicted value, so we can later compare and see how well we did. And how's the speed, is this good? Excellent. Thank you. And so that begs the question, how, how did we do? And uh, I think the answer is not bad. Uh, this is, I think, pretty good. We're about 77% accurate on the test data. So given that we've trained on a bunch of data from the stop data set, 77% of the time we're right when someone says, hey, uh, here's this type of person. Do you think that they had some kind of post-stop activity? This is pretty close to the best I've been able to do with this data set. Um, I'm, I'm currently uh, enrolled in the Georgia Tech online uh, Masters of Science in Computer Science uh, studying machine learning. And so I've worked with this data set for a, a couple of months. Um, and actually with a boosted decision tree, uh, we can get, I think, 81% accuracy, which I think is my high watermark. Um, so again, there's a fair amount of tuning you can do to um, try to get superior results. The downside of this um, is, is something that I think is incredibly important and something that doesn't get mentioned a lot when we talk about machine learning, um, is that when we have tools like this for things like police data, right, the immediate thing is we're like, okay, great, you know, we're gonna get a minority report early. We're gonna be able to say, hey, given this type of person, we know uh, if there's post-op activity, we know who we're supposed to be searching, we know who we're supposed to be arresting, um, and, you know, criminal justice is now a, a solved problem. And I think the, in the insidious problem here is that if the data itself is biased by human judgment. We have to be very careful that we don't assume later down the road when we've sort of forgotten this that the machine is telling us what to do and the machine can't possibly be biased. And so if the machine says to arrest this person, we should. If the machine says this person is probably a criminal, they probably are, uh, which is not correct. Uh, it probably does not surprise you to know that uh, the sex and race of the person is an extremely powerful predictor of post-op activity. And if it turns out that if there's some racist dimension to the data, you are going to end up with a racist machine. So it is important for us to 
remember that and not pretend that because the data someday somewhere out of the pipe, you know, up here from some machine learning algorithm, that uh, magically that is sort of bias free. There is always bias, both literal bias in the machine learning algorithm and bias in the data. Okay, so that got a bit heavy, so we're gonna pivot to decision trees, away from decision trees rather, and to uh, taking a look at a, a sort of different machine learning tool, uh, neural networks, uh, and a new framework slash library, uh, DL4j. So we'll, we'll pivot away from the binary classification portion of our program and move on to uh, some convolutional neural network magic and a little bit of uh, image recognition and image identification. So what is deep learning? It's in the news all the time now. I feel like Google is just kind of putting out a new deep learning paper every 10 minutes. Um, so to answer that question, it's sort of valuable to think more about um, neural networks and then deep neural networks. Uh, neural networks are a computational architecture that are modeled after the human brain. Uh, the idea is to have many neurons, which are effectively functions. And with these functions, you have sort of a, an analogy to dendrites in the, in the brain. So, so human, or I guess animal neurons have these little dendrites, little branches that kind of all go into the cell body, and then a single axon that comes out. And sort of, you know, synaptic information comes in through these dendrites and then you sort of fire through this axon. Uh, or that's at least the limits of my uh, high school biology understanding of how neurons work. And so you can kind of think of these artificial neurons. Uh, you have a function that is sort of effectively the cell body. You can think of the dendrites being sort of like vectors of signals and weights, like here's some information and here's how heavily that, you know, this, this value should be weighted. Um, and then the axon is sort of like the output. Uh, sometimes we threshold it and say, you know, it's kind of like a neuron actually firing. Um, given these values and these weights that come in, uh, do we fire or not? Um, or sometimes we don't threshold, we just return a real number, um, some value, uh, which depends on sort of the problem that we're solving and the, and the domain. So during training, the network will kind of tune these weights internally, and that's one of the downsides of neural networks is they're kind of a black box. We don't really see the, the set of weights that live inside the network, and even if we did, they wouldn't make sense to us. And the network sort of tunes these weights via, generally speaking, via back propagation. Um, if you're not familiar, the idea is sort of, um, you know, we're making these educated guesses as a neural network. When we're told that we're wrong, that error kind of propagates backward through the various layers of the network, and we adjust our weights accordingly. Uh, I actually uh, wrote a blog post um, early this year, kind of translating some, some Python simple neural network stuff into Clojure, and it, it came out okay, I think. Um, so uh, feel free to, to look that up when the slides come out, which should be later today. So when a, a neural network uh, has many layers, which is sort of an ambiguous <laughs> definition, but generally speaking, more than one hidden layer, uh, so more than three layers total, uh, it's a, now a deep neural network. Uh, generally speaking, most deep neural networks are larger than three layers, and, and in practice they can have hundreds of layers, um, which leads to an interesting problem, and it's this idea of the vanishing or uh, exploding gradient. And the idea sort of works like this. Because each of the neural network's weights that come in are, are updated proportionally uh, to the gradient of the error function, um, sort of respect with, with, with respect to each of the, the current weight in each iteration, um, these weights are very, very small, generally speaking. Um, they're tiny fractional real values between negative one and one, or between zero and one. And so what happens is it's kind of this error signal kind of exponentially decays as it goes back through the layers, uh, because you're just multiplying these super tiny numbers by each other over and over and over again. And uh, when you have this kind of decay, it's, it can be tricky, you can sort of stop learning in your network. So people spend a lot of time thinking about activation functions and various methods that you can use to tune the network to make sure that you don't have this problem. Uh, there's a corresponding problem called the exploding gradient when weights are very, very high. Uh, not only does it cause the same sort of problem, you have this like stampeding gradient through your network, but we found that uh, generally speaking, if you have lots and lots of nodes or very, very high weights, you tend to overfit. Um, and so we uh, have a couple tools. One of them is regularization, uh, which sort of penalizes high weights to kind of not only combat exploding gradients, but also kind of keep overfitting in check. So that sort of sets the stage a little bit, you know, uh, with neural networks, deep neural networks. And so when it comes to deep learning, one very interesting type of neural network is a, a convolutional neural network. Um, so it's a type of deep neural network, and it, its name comes from uh, the verb uh, convolve, to sort of roll over or roll together. And the idea is, is like this. There are many filter layers, uh, each of which sort of passes over the image, 
and picks out a feature that it's filtering for. So you might have a, a filter that's looking for tiny horizontal lines or tiny vertical lines or tiny diagonal lines or little curves, things like that. Um, and if you look at the, the animation here, um, you can sort of see you've got these three filters in pink. Um, you can almost imagine like this little magnifying glass kind of scrolling over the image. And when a feature in the image sort of lines up with the kind of shape in the filter that that filter's looking for, uh, you can almost imagine it kind of like, I guess, brightening up, right? There's a very high signal. It's to use kind of a light-based analogy. Um, and so what happens then is we get a, a feature map based on this. We know where these kind of like high signal points are, and we construct a map of the entire image saying, hey, um, here's where I found all the tiny vertical lines. And you might imagine like an image with just all these little tiny vertical lines, and then here's where I found all the little diagonal lines and all the little you know, C-shaped curves or, or something like that. Uh, and these stacks of feature maps are sort of how machine uh, convolutional networks see, uh, which is very interesting because, you know, for something that's modeled on human cognition, uh, this vision scheme doesn't seem to be how we see things. We don't seem to kind of construct the world from all these tiny itty bitty lines, at least not consciously. Um, and this image comes from uh, the deep learning, uh, the DL4j website, so I encourage you to go check it out there. I think uh, Andre Karpathy is the uh, creator or source of the image, so thanks also to him. I think there's a couple more. Um, that he's responsible for, and they're, they're super valuable uh, learning aids. And convolutional nets are generally uh, well suited to image recognition, so when you see these things come from Google, it's often image classification, you know, is this a car, is this not a car, uh, image search kind of clustering things that look like, the, you know, each other, it's sort of an unsupervised learning approach. Um, or facial recognition, which is, I think, generally the sort of go-to example that people think of when they think about um, sort of AI or, or machine learning uh, as applied to computer vision and neural networks. So the, again, sort of the, the, the phantom haunting us this whole time is this notion of overfitting. This idea that, you know, we're going to believe the data too much, that we're not going to be able to generalize well. Um, so highly dimensional data will, will lead to overfitting, but also degrade performance. This is all hugely computationally expensive. So to deal with this, we, we generally interleave convolutional layers with what are called max pooling or sort of like subsampling or downsampling layers. Uh, and the idea behind uh, max pooling, rather than say average pooling, is that whenever you have kind of a space in your image, you kind of pick out the, or in your feature map, you pick out the highest intensity one, sort of the brightest spot. So if you look at the example, there's this little red sector with one, one, five, six, and we kind of sample that down to six. There's two, four, seven, eight, we sample that down to eight. And we do lose data when we do this, sort of by design and by definition, uh, in order to make the problem more computationally tractable, but also to sort of ensure that we find these lit up pixels and they stay lit. Uh, if we were to do something like averaging, you could imagine this if we're going to extend the light metaphor, sort of diffusing that glow. And what we really want is to, to know exactly where these bright spots on the map are so we can work with them. And so finally, we have now, I think, a, a decent mental model of how these convolutional networks are designed. You have kind of an input layer that takes in the image. You build a stack of feature maps. And uh, for each of these feature maps, you'll go through and you'll sort of downsample to discard data and keep things sort of computationally tractable. Um, they'll go and, and convolve, you'll kind of look over the image for, you know, maybe a new set of features, uh, downsample again, and kind of do this ad infinitum uh, until you reach your fully connected, uh, in this case, a fully connected uh, multi-layer perceptron, and you have an output layer that might output, yes, that's a car, or hey, yes, this, this belongs with these other red things, uh, or, or something like that. Um, you know, in this case, we might have a label that's, uh, Super creepy house, I guess, um, as opposed to, you know, baby sea turtle or, or something like that. So speaking of baby sea turtles, um, our data involves them. Uh, this image comes from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service by way of the uh, Deep Learning for J or DL for J example GitHub repo. So um, DL for J, uh, as I've alluded, uh, is an open source distributed deep learning library uh, for the JVM. There are uh, official bindings for Java, Scala, and Python. As far as I know, there's not an official closure one. Um, so there's going to be a fair amount of interop in the code that I'll show you. Um, and both DL4j and the uh, sort of DL4j examples are available on GitHub so that uh, second link is the link to uh, DL4j. The third one that's minified is uh, a direct link to the convolutional neural net worked example that we're going to follow for the rest of this talk. Um, I don't think the interop is too, too bad. It's, it's a little ugly, is my only complaint. Uh, so I, I would like kind of a, a nice DL, uh, uh, sorry, a, a nice uh, 
a DSL or a nice kind of wrapper library for, for deep learning for J. So if you know of one, please let me know. Uh, I would like to use it or contribute. If there isn't one, uh, we as a community should band together and make one. Uh, okay, that came out better than I thought. I apologize if, apologize if it's a little bit hard to read. Um, there's a fair amount of Java interop. Uh, so the idea here is we have sort of a, an idea of a neural network configuration. Uh, so we're going to call the neural net configuration builder from DL4J. And I've omitted some values and some tuning for space reasons. Uh, so we have an activation function, uh, ReLU, which I, I imagine is how you'd pronounce the <laughs> uh, abbreviation. Uh, and again, kind of harkening back to that, our discussion of, you know, if you, you want to be very careful about the activation function that you pick uh, in order to avoid sort of gradient problems. Uh, a learning rate of uh, 0 0.0001, uh, which is just from some playing around. Uh, we initialize the weights to, uh, I guess, the Xavier weights. Uh, I'm actually not quite sure what these are. Generally speaking, you initialize your weights to very small random numbers, but uh, so hopefully that's what those are. Um, the optimization algorithm we picked is uh, stochastic gradient descent, and uh, we have this uh, updating method, which is RMS prop, which I believe is uh, root mean squared error propagation, or prop rather, um, a momentum term of 0.9. Uh, momentum is sort of this notion of I guess you can imagine kind of kicking you down the gradient slope, because uh, there are occasionally, if you have a very wiggly uh, surface, you could get stuck in local minima if you want to get all the way down to the minimum error. Uh, the momentum kind of, kind of kicks you through these little valleys so you can aim at the big one. And then there are uh, six layers here, uh, an initial layer, uh, a max pooling layer, a five by five, sort of like you can imagine like a five by five pixel convolutional layer, uh, another max pooling layer, and then a fully connected layer, uh, after which we, we output the result of our deep learning magic. Uh, and one of the things that I, I don't so much mind the, the, the need for the threading macro and the sort of builder syntax. I, I would like even just a, a nice wrapper around <laughs> interrays. I can tell you that in my experience, um, munging ints and longs and, and stuff like that, uh, especially as we, we heard earlier, you know, closure is um, not, ideal when it comes to error messages, and sometimes if you're going through the interop message and the closure message, and you're, there's no such method, and you're having a hard time, and you're like, oh, wait, this is actually, you know, it's looking for a long, and this is a double. Um, so if that happens to you, that is possibly your uh, root cause. So how did we do? So using this particular neural network configuration, um, we have an accuracy of 0.375, precision of 0.3, recall of 0.375, and an F1 score of 0.3529 which is actually not terrible. There are actually, there are only four animals that are in this data set, uh, bears, ducks, deer, and turtles. Uh, so if we got 0.25 or worse than 0.25, I would be worried <laughs> because then we would be kind of random or worse. Um, but it seems that there is some value kind of, you know, there are some patterns being detected by the network um, that, are, that are sort of figuring out what, what's, a, what's a duck and what's a deer and what's a bear and what's a turtle. And I think it's worth teasing out the, uh, this notion of precision and recall and, and the F1 score. Um, Precision is the fraction of retrieved instances that are relevant. Um, whereas recall is sort of the flip side of that. It's the number of uh, relevant instances that you retrieve. So um, given all of the possible relevant ones, like how many of them did you get, as opposed to of the ones you got, how many were actually relevant. Uh, and the F1 score is sort of just a measure of the test accuracy. Um, if I recall correctly, I think it's, it's twice the products of the precision and the recall over the, the sum of the precision and the recall. But yeah, we're, we're doing better than chance, which is nice. Unfortunately, we're not doing as well as humans. Humans uh, generally have, you know, 90 some odd percent accuracy on tests like this. Uh, though the good news is that state-of-the-art neural networks, uh, kind of the stuff you find described in Google's papers or Microsoft's papers, are achieving near-human accuracy uh, in image recognition tasks um, in the neighborhood of, of 90 or, or 95 percent, uh, which is likely the fact that they have millions and millions of images, and I think this is dozens and dozens of images. <laughs> so um, as we talked about earlier, you know, if you're limited in the data that you have, um, it's very difficult to generalize well. So more data uh, is more better, I guess. So how did we do? What did we learn? What did we talk about? Uh, well, we talked about machine learning and Spark and how Clojure and Spark are awesome. Um, how Flambo and Sparkling are roughly, I think, equally powerful, but sort of in, in kind of a get you going type way, like setting up the Spark context, mapping functions over RDDs, uh, manipulating and counting instances, things like that. Um, but as far as I can tell, there are not very strong wrappers for things like decision tree modeling, for things like decision tree predicting. Um, and it would be neat, I think, to have a, a more of that. Um, so there's still a little bit of interop that we had to, to handle. And we saw there was lots of interop with, with DL4J. Um, you know, I would love to help investigate 
finding building uh, a nice closure DSL for DL4j. Um, so deep learning is super doable with closure, but the interop makes it not as beautiful as we would like. Uh, and I would like, I think, eventually to kind of take the LA open data that we've got, the, this sort of notion of, you know, who's getting pulled over, who's getting arrested, who's getting searched, uh, and this ability for convolutional neural networks with lots and lots and lots of data to figure out what's in the image, classify the image, cluster images, and sort of combine these in a, in a careful way. Because as I, as I said, you know, you can imagine having a, a super powerful ConfNet and, uh, you know, a bunch of data about who's getting arrested or pulled over together uh, based on the data that we have and, and biases in the U.S. and, frankly, elsewhere, it's, you know, it's very easy, again, to get biased data and tell ourselves that it can't be biased because it comes from a machine. So I'm super interested in these fields technically, but also socially. And the takeaways, the, the TL DPA, uh, which is what I, I call the, the too long, didn't pay attention. Um, so uh, the closure community is fantastic, as you guys know. You are part of it, and you help make it awesome. So thank you. Um, I'd really like to work more on libraries like Flambeau and, and Sparkling. Uh, so contributing to those, I think, is huge. Um, Flambeau, I think, is under active development. I think Sparkling is too, but Sparkling, I don't think, has had a commit since May. So I'd be super interested in seeing more work on those. Um, ditto for uh, DL4J, either building or contributing to or, or forming uh, a nice closure first solution for deep learning, I think, would be, would be huge. Uh, and uh, the complete code for this example, for the binary classification example, and for the ConvNet are uh, on GitHub. Uh, feel free to pull it down, run it, make a PR, things like that. Uh, I'm happy to have as much help as possible. Oh, uh, although it occurs to me, I have not yet made the repo public. So don't do that right now. <laughs> but when I, uh, when I share the link to the presentation on Speaker Deck, which should be later today, um, I'll make sure to also kind of like tweet out the, uh, the link to the, uh, the GitHub repo as well. But it's just my name, Eric Q. Weinstein, uh, slash Euro Closure. Um, and like I said, the slides will be available a little bit later on today. So, like I said, thanks again for coming to my talk. Um, I really, this is my favorite thing. I like to use this one a lot. Um, thank you. So, yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, you guys are great. Um, thank you for choosing to spend your time with me. Um, I'm not going to take questions now, but please do come find me later. If you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Um, or if we don't catch each other here in Bratislava, please tweet at me or yell at me on the internet, and I'm, I'm happy to try to help. Thanks so much.